So I'd like to introduce the next speaker, uh, who is David Brand, as Gretchen mentioned. Uh, David is the managing director of New Forest. New Forest is a forestry investment firm that manages over $100 million in forestry assets throughout Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia, and has also been active here in Hawaii. New Forest is unique in that it seeks to deliver both traditional timber return as well as returns from emerging environmental markets such as carbon, biodiversity, and water quality. As such, New Forest has become an expert in what they call, quote, timber plus business models. Before founding New Forest, David was responsible for the design and oversight of forest investment programs for Hancock Natural Resource Group. And prior to joining Hancock, David was the Executive General Manager of State Forests of New South Wales, Australia, where he was quite active in supporting the development of carbon trading in Australia. Today, David is going to speak with us about emerging carbon markets worldwide and opportunities here in Hawaii. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Leba, and uh, thanks to Gretchen for the invitation to come and uh, speak here as part of this panel. And thank you to the organizers. It's a pleasure to be back in uh, Hawaii and to um, have a chance to meet with a few folks that I've known over the last few years. In fact, I first came to Hawaii in 1999. I think it was a Senate-sponsored panel discussion about forestry and carbon credits. So it's sort of a subject that's been around for a while. Um, so my perspective on the panel today really is uh, the perspective of an investor. and. Uh, trying to look at how investment flows will change and respond to the pricing of ecosystem services. And I think this is very important because uh, I think my personal view is that the end game in all of the business of conservation is the point where uh, it's not just philanthropic or government funding that's supporting conservation, but it's that those mainstream capital flows. Because today, while we have you know, tens of billions of dollars of aid and philanthropic funding and government funds, we have tens of trillions of dollars of capital flow around the world. And uh, in a sense, uh, if we don't harness those big capital flows, it's very, you're fighting an uphill battle in terms of trying to get uh, sustainable conservation outcomes. So uh, not to be uh, a mercenary about this, but ultimately what it comes down to is uh, making the economic case and, and actually making the case that it can be more profitable to manage uh, forests and ecosystems on a conservation basis rather than converting them and developing them for a shopping mall or to grow palm oil or whatever the alternative might be. So what I'd like to talk about quickly is just to introduce our company, although Liba has kind of already done that. Uh, talk about forestry because that's really our business is around forest ecosystems and what its role might be in Hawaii. Uh, how can forestry be part of uh, uh, creating sustainable landscapes in Hawaii and then where are we at with these eco markets and how do they affect and shift the economics uh, of land management. Okay, well, we are a forestry investment management advisory services business. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as an EMO, which is an ecosystem investment management organization, uh, maybe the only one. Um, but we manage about $130 million in forestry assets. Uh, it's about 200,000 acres of land. It's all certified under the Forest Stewardship Council. And uh, really what we present as our core competency or differentiating factor is that we'll look at up to 15 different 
environmental attributes of the forests that we manage and try to monetize those and therefore generate higher returns to our clients than people that are just looking at a sort of timber management or selling land into HBU and so on. Okay, well, um, I guess my view of forests is that they are kind of a natural infrastructure and in the same way that we build toll roads or hospitals or airports to provide services, uh, these ecosystems are providing those services to us uh, for free, effectively. And uh, I think Hawaiians, Hawaii's forest ecosystem infrastructure, as we heard this morning, has been affected by uh, invasive species and, and land conversion. And there's really a need to try to find uh, sustainable uh, forest management or land use models. Um, certainly, uh, this is a a place in the world where trees grow very well. You have high rainfall, volcanic soils, and, and trees will grow here. You can certainly produce uh, timber and other types of goods and services. Uh, but the high value of land and, and the value of alternative uses has often uh, uh, led the land into uh, conversion and development. So I guess the question is, if we're going to maintain forests or even rehabilitate forests in the landscape in Hawaii, uh, what is the model that, that's uh, correct? And that model is going to have to reflect uh, the market signals uh, around um, the economics of growing and managing forests here. The good news from the investment side is there is uh, lots of interest in investing in forests and investing in forest ecosystems and taking positions on assets that have exposure to these emerging ecological markets. Um, People like forestry because it's a very long dated asset. So if you have a pension fund and your average member is 35 years old, you're looking for things that will mature in say 30 years. Uh, forests are one of the few things that do that. They tend to be uncorrelated with the stock market. Every year the trees just grow and get more valuable. Uh, it doesn't matter what the uh, currency exchange rate between uh, the US and, uh, and the Euro is. Uh, and uh, certainly, I think worldwide forests are increasingly becoming uh, scarce and valuable, uh, particularly as some of the key tropical forest regions have been largely over harvested and now we're seeing really significant increases in the value of timber. Species like uh, teak have been appreciating at 7 to 10 percent real price appreciation per year for, for several years now. And then lastly, uh, when we talk to investors in London, New York, wherever, I mean, they're very switched on about the emergence of these uh, eco markets and uh, have seen the global carbon market go from $1 billion in turnover two years ago to $30 billion of turnover last year, probably $50 billion in turnover this year. And so investors have become awake to the idea that these environmental and eco markets are uh, starting to emerge and become real investable uh, propositions for them. Well, from uh, the few visits I've um, had to Hawaii, I guess uh, the message that I get is that there is a strong uh, sense that government and community groups want to see open space and natural systems preserved, uh, but increasingly it's difficult to generate investment in forestry. The returns are, are quite low. Um, and particularly uh, have difficulty competing with alternative strategies such as property development. Um, rural forestry projects in Hawaii can be seen as complex and dealing with uh, uh, various landowners and, and trying to establish uh, lease structures and so on. And finally, there has been a fairly limited market for both timber products and eco products uh, here in Hawaii to date. And so uh, it, it is. Uh, an area with a lot of unrealized potential, I would say, at this point, although there are some very positive uh, things starting to occur. I guess to just back up and explain sort of our investment model. Uh, here if we take, uh, this is what we might say is today's world. You know, on the left-hand side, we have an area that has been largely converted to cattle grazing. It has maybe some residual streamside areas and some patches of uh, remaining natural forest. If we wanted to convert that over and reforest it so that it had a mix of riparian vegetation, plantation timber, and so on, that might have much uh, better water quality, higher carbon stocks, and, and higher biodiversity, 
none of those things are priced. And so what tends to happen is the system gets stuck in the sort of standard uh, cattle grazing type of uh, uh, management regime. On the other hand, if these things do start to get priced, then we very quickly shift from the left to the right because now we're going to get paid carbon credits as the forest grows. We're going to get paid for improved water quality uh, because we've reestablished riparian zones and reduced erosion or nutrient leaching. And we have probably created connectivity and improved habitat and may even have some uh, species banking or conservation credits that can flow out of that. So that's what that sort of says is that uh, investors will invest the capital when the returns are there and, and for the returns to be there we've got to get some of these uh, commercial drivers in place and then there's no shortage of capital uh, to make that kind of transition. And it's kind of exciting uh, in Australia uh, where I live uh, to see that's now happening and you know this is a diagram I made probably seven or eight years ago and it's sort of interesting now that it's coming to pass uh, on the left-hand side, this is a, a landscape that has cattle and sheep grazing in the, in the back country, dryland agriculture on the lower slopes, and then irrigated cotton, let's say, down in the river valleys. Um, it has all kinds of uh, environmental issues around dryland salinity, uh, saline discharge, nutrient leaching, low biodiversity, a lot of feral animals and, and weeds, and soil er erosion, turbid water, declining water quality. So you can't really say that that landscape is sustainable as a system. On the right-hand side, uh, what we've now seen occurs, we have a carbon market in New South Wales. We have uh, uh, organized watershed management boards with real money to spend that simply buy ecosystem services. We've got high renewable energy targets that start to create uh, new markets for uh, charcoal and, and uh, uh, timber products and so on. And so we now have uh, emerging a much more diverse economy. And that's important in a situation where we've got this El Nino cycle. So agribusiness tends to be very up and down. So when you start to get this economy where you have more goods and also payment for ecosystem services, it starts to make a more robust uh, economy and actually uh, can create uh, additional jobs. So how do we make that transition? Um, I think that the, the key thing that uh, Gretchen pointed out is that ecosystems have to become an asset. In a lot of places in the world, people have regulated uh, landowners that they have to provide these ecological goods, and in fact, they've created them as a liability on the balance sheet. And what happens then is people are uh, not overly enthusiastic about protecting their endangered species habitat or whatever because they're being forced to do it rather than being rewarded for uh, managing that habitat. Uh, even subsidy-based schemes don't tend to be sustainable because once you stop paying the subsidy, then people convert back to their old land use. I mean, I saw that in Africa where there had been a big payment to the Maasai to take the goats out and let the wildlife come back. Then when they stopped getting paid, well, the goats started drifting back in. So you really need a fundamental change in the underlying economics, and that's where you know, we believe that market-based instruments that set long-term durable prices for things like carbon, water, and biodiversity will really change land use and will change patterns of uh, investment flow. Um, to make markets work, I mean, governments really need to intervene and set cap-and-trade type systems. Uh, we need to have uh, good property rights, standardized measurements, all the things that I think that Gretchen already mentioned, and then what will happen is companies like ours will come in as intermediaries and start to work with landowners to pool up carbon or biodiversity assets and bring them to the market in the same way that a, a wheat pool aggregates up, you know, the individual wheat uh, produce of different farmers and takes it into the, to the market. Just a quick uh, look at the size of these markets. As I said, the, the carbon market worldwide hit about $30 billion in turnover in 2006. The, the bulk of that is all around the Kyoto Protocol market. That's the yellow uh, circles. But increasingly, we have smaller markets. The retail market on the bottom right-hand side in the US uh, appears to have turned over about $100 million in transactions last year. We've now got a carbon trading market starting in the northeast of the U.S. and in California. I understand that uh, Hawaii has set a, a cap on emissions as recently as uh, the last month. 
Um, so there is a whole proliferation of these carbon markets emerging, and they seem to be doubling in size every year. And now, for example, I think there's something like uh, $15 billion in commercial carbon funds that have been raised to just go out and, and buy a spread of these uh, uh, carbon instruments. Endangered species banking, similar kind of uh, rapid growth. We can see in the U.S. now approaching 100 endangered species banks, turnover of 200 to 300 million dollars per annum in endangered species credits, and uh, prices ranging up to 125,000 dollars for a breeding pair of some bird species. Wetlands mitigation banking, similar uh, high growth rates, uh, probably over a billion dollars a year now in turnover of wetlands mitigation credits, so all of this is now starting to become a reality and starting to become a fairly big business. So from the perspective of investors and, and land managers, the key thing is to simply put this together as a, a commercial proposition, uh, design investments that will take advantage of the revenues flowing from these new eco markets and uh, provide it as a, an alternative class of investment. And our investors, I mean, they're looking at a toll road one day, a property development in California the next, and then here's an eco product development. Uh, and they just look at the risk return profile and the term of the investment and, and so on. And if, it, uh, is, if it's competitive, then they will invest in it. Um, just an example of a, a deal that we did in Australia where you can see here, uh, we had our original timber return and then have added in uh, carbon trading, payments for water, credits, uh, leasing an area for a wind farm, and actually half of the returns now are coming in that transaction from uh, the eco markets as opposed to the underlying traditional timber. So the uh, goal really is uh, to see these uh, markets established in Hawaii to uh, either to have Hawaii develop its own regulatory systems or potentially to join with California or other states to develop uh, cap and trade systems. Uh, and I think also from the point of view of Hawaiian landowners, there's some very large, significant landowners who could take the lead in creating some of these pooling vehicles that create efficient sort of supply side uh, vehicles for interfacing with these markets as they develop. So in conclusion, uh, you know, the investment side of this is important because this is what drives the change, drives the long-term uh, land use uh, management uh, strategies that are pursued and, and the funding, the investment dollars are certainly not limited. It's just a matter of creating the deals that can compete with other things that people can invest in. Um, there is a, a strong appetite for forestry for investing in these type of ecological assets at the moment. And really at the end of the day, if, uh, if there's a need for billions of dollars of capital to uh, conserve and replenish the natural infrastructure of Hawaii, it's, it's going to have to come at least significantly uh, from private capital. Thank you very much.